And then from, yeah, from the, the competitive cycling background, just the understanding a lot from the psychological, like the, the sports um, psyche side of things is really helpful. In addition to, you know, the, the day in, day out, knowing that, okay, if I do all these small things, very deliberate practice, the thing I've practiced this week starts to become more ingrained. And then next week I can practice another little thing. And the week after that, I can practice another little thing. And you kind of break your trading down in little pieces. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Market Stalkers channel. This is the fifth episode of my series, Drink with Traders, where I sit down casually to chat with traders who have piqued my interest. Today, I have invited Tim Reset of eMini Mind to join me. Now, Tim is not only an excellent trader, but he's also a pro cyclist. Tim, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So what are we drinking today? Oh, I've got a margarita, seeing as it's a little Very after nice. nine here in the States. Go for a ride later, so I figured that'd be a good uh, pre-ride drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, why not? Why not? All right. Now, we first met uh, when we were both doing that Top Step panel earlier this year. Um, now, the reason why I invited you is because as we were kind of answering those questions from the, the viewers that sent in their you know, various queries, everything that you talked about had some big parallels with what I went through and what I did to level up my trading skills. So I wanted to take this opportunity to explore some of your beginnings. So tell me, um, how did you get interested in trading? So I had a friend uh, whose dad was uh, down in the Chicago Board of Trade. I lived outside Chicago area. And I'd always kind of been interested in kind of taking control of my own finances. I think that's, a, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur or some type of, um, you know, a trader, you probably have an interest in kind of taking control. So I uh, got the opportunity to go down to the Chicago Board of Trade. And from there, those guys, it was mostly guys down in pits. This would have been, you know, early 2000s. They were kind of discouraging us from making a career in the, in the on the floor just because the, the things were dying up and, you know, computers had been around for a long time and that's where trading was going. So from those couple of pit traders put us in touch with some guys who'd been trading on the screen since like the late 80s. And that's where we got started with uh, with with day trading and the the e mini S and P and and then they kind of shepherded us and gave us good uh, words of wisdom to start out and from there um, my trading grew to really to what it is today but that was the start of um, my trading and still trading the e mini S and P. So you had a really, really uh, lucky situation there to uh, be mentored by actual traders from the beginning. Yeah, I I often use the phrase, you know, find your unfair advantage. And, you know, coming from the sports world or, you know, your physical abilities or your maybe you're gifted mentally in certain areas. But everybody has some sort of unfair advantage that, you know, to somebody else, they might see it as unfair, but I had the ability of being close to Chicago, access to traders, a friend's dad who worked on the floor, and you know that really uh, snowballed the uh, my trading experience. Now, most people who get into trading, they they kind of bumble around it precisely because they don't really have anybody to to show them the ropes, so to speak. And for many people, that journey can be like seven years, 10 years. How long did it take you to get good? So I started first off with swing trading and swing trading individual stocks, um, a little bit of options, but, but very basic. And so I had about two years of swing trading under my belt before I started day trading and starting with swing trading was very nice because when you're only looking at daily charts, it really slows down your, um, you know, the, the inputs. I'm only looking at the charts based off of, you know, one daily candle every yeah, day. There's only so many setups that you can have in a week, right? Yeah. 
and you, you can do all your analysis after the market's closed. So you don't have all these moving parts that you're trying to assess in real time. So I did about two years of swing trading and had, you know, really good results and was kind of scaling up um, over, I would say, the second of the two years. And then I started incorporating day trading. And that that in itself, even though I had experience with trading and had really good disciplines, um, that was a good year and a half or so, two years before I really felt like, okay, I'm, things are clicking. I'm confident in, you know, making reasonably sized trades and felt like I had, had a good groove. So, uh, you know, some people slower and some people quicker, but just that there's no shortcut for that time in front of the screen. I mean, you could sit down with someone and learn a strategy, but you still need those repetitions and to see it day in and day out. And so, yeah, having, you know, a year and a half to two years of every day in front of the screen, you know, for so the just part, practice. five days a week. Practice, yeah. Practice, yeah. Practice, a lot of practice yeah. hmm, and yeah. not so much practice of the trade setup and the execution, but like understanding how you're mentally going to respond and how you're mm. going to feel in all of these different situations. How do I feel when I'm up a point on a trade or up just a couple of ticks? Am I going to make a mistake and derail my trading plan because I'm afraid to lose money and then I just get out early? You know, it's so a huge so psychological kind of to, component. Yeah. Yeah. And without putting yourself in those situations, you know, you, you don't always know how you're going to react and then you can practice those situations over and over again. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they get into trading, everybody has this idea how, you know, by month three, everybody's going to be smashing it and making money. And very quickly, most people realize that's not the case. It's much harder because of that psychological component. And because at the end of the day, trading pokes in that uh, fight or flight response for many mm -hmm. people. And then you find out a whole bunch of stuff about yourself that you didn't even know was there. Uh, now, talk to me about your morning routine. Is there anything that uh, that you do to set yourself up for the day? Um, do you look at uh, overnight trading? How do you approach your day? So if we're talking about day trading, yeah. I really come in the morning um, with a clean slate. Uh, I will. I really don't look at the market's too far before the bell, I take a peek at, okay, what news announcements are coming out at the top of the hour, if we're talking about the NICE open. Um, look at the prior days, high, low, and close. You know, are we gapping? Um, is it a small gap, big gap? Are we moving? Are we gapping outside of the prior day's range? So just some of those basic kind of reference points of getting my bearings. I don't really build this big uh, you know, this big narrative about, oh, okay, this is what the market's going to do today, because that could all change, you know, as soon as the market opens. See, the way I approach it, I always have like three or four scenarios for both sides. And that kind of keeps me unbiased and keeps me open minded mm -hmm. to whatever might, might happen. Do you do that as well? Or is it something that just comes naturally to you as the market is developing? Yeah, I, I'm I guess I am thinking of, okay, well, we could go up, down, or sideways for the most yeah, part. Yeah, so scenarios. And, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, it's, okay, if we if we gap up, here's a couple of scenarios that I've seen in the past. If we gap down, if there's no gap, um, a day like today where we're kind of quiet and moving mm -hmm. sideways, at least in the first hour or so, um, yeah, you kind of have those scenarios just based off of seeing, you know, prior days. And one thing you can do is, you know, go back and, you know, look at a whole bunch of range bound days just side by side to kind of familiarize yourself with those characteristics. Go look at a bunch of um, gap and go days or big trend days and look at all those days side by side. And then it helps, you know, because if you're seeing, OK, today's a range day, tomorrow's a trend day, the next day is a range day. Um, when you spread it out, sometimes, yeah, you can pick out little things here and there, but you don't always know why your your brain is sort of giving you that thought or idea. Whereas if you look at 20 days side by side and they're all a pretty similar type of day, that can help shed some light on, okay, these are some of the characteristics or similarities that we see in the first 15 minutes 
that kind of indicate we're going to be a slower yeah, range. So we do that all the time as well. So um, when the market opens way outside of range with a gap up or gap down, um, there's always a higher chance of the market going back to the previous day range before it does anything else. So uh, that's definitely a parallel to uh, to what many, many traders do. Whoever I've spoken to, whoever is successful, very few people will go, oh yeah, well, if something gaps up or down, I'm just going to go in the same direction. Because for the most part, that's not going to be true. So it's very interesting to hear you say that. Um, now, every trader has their own journey. You know, some people have a very turbulent journey. So they have major wins, major losses. Uh, did you have any such moments that kind of stuck in your mind as a defining moment? Um, I never blew up an account, fortunately. And you know, those initial our men, trading mentors, my a friend and uh, my friend and I, you know, they instilled always use stops. You have to go into the trade, you know, focusing on your risk first. You can't just swing for a home run every time, or you just miss the ball most of the mm -hmm. time. And, um, so I never had any major losses. I found that, um, you know, using a really, really tight stop on the ES is very difficult. There's been some tweaks or moments over the years where things clicked and it wasn't necessarily, you know, having some giant winning trade or having a catastrophic losing trade that made me go, aha, but, um, <laughs> you know, having a reasonable size stop, like two or three points on the ES is much better than having, you know, a two or three tick stop. Um, and then one, probably the biggest aha moment or, or moment that really, um, accelerated my trading, especially from the mental side was when I broke up my positions into a small target and a trail stop. So mm -hmm. rather than having to you know, have a fixed target on every trade or have a trail stop on every trade. I just cut it down the middle and half the position was a smaller fixed target and half of the position was a trail stop. That way, you know, I can sit back and the market can do whatever it wants to do. If it wants to go four points and turn around, well, I can take my small target, come away with a small winner and be out. If it wants to rip, then I can still get that small target locked in, but then I can have the uh, patience and sort of stress off my back to just sit back and say, well, worst case, it's a small winner. And if this thing wants to run and go 20 points, great. I'm still in the trade and I'm participating. So then mm -hmm. it doesn't become this mind game of, oh, well, the last time the trade was a runner, so I better trail my stop. Then you trail your stop and then it goes four points and turns around and then you say, oh, I, next time I need to use a fixed stop. Yeah, kind of what, what I what, what I find that uh, in my in uh, because I I coach traders as well uh, who are kind of struggling and want to get to that next level. Um, some of them come to me having trailed their stops on every single trade without actually looking at what type of trade they have. And they're like, oh, it's not working. And I'm like, well, of course it's not going to work because you're not really looking at the setup in a different way. Not every setup is going to need a trading stop and not every, uh, every trade is going to go a bazillion points. You know? So there's a systematic way of doing it. But at the same time, you're not super rigid. You still have that creativity and flexibility to recognize mm -hmm. what's needed. So I think that's the, the trick to, to making trading stops um, work for people. Because a lot of people are like, oh, my God, I was right on the trade, but now I'm not in. And now what? <laughs> and then they mm -hmm. uh, they have this massive FOMO that they, they missed out and uh, they were right, but they didn't make money. And it gets them onto this whole different psychological negative level. Um, so yeah. did you have any such moments? How did you get to, to the point where you developed your strategy? Was that somebody who, uh, who also told you, Here, here's how you do it? Was it something that came from your own data analytics, looking at your previous performance? I'm always interested to hear the process. So with swing trading, um, you know, I was basically buying strong stocks on pullbacks and selling weak stocks on bounces. And so when it comes to kind of using that in the day trading sense, I was still looking at swing highs and swing lows and incorporating more of a, you know, traditional 50% as the pullback point. Um, and so a lot of the parallels came from swing trading just off mm -hmm. of, you know, basic, okay, where do these trends start? And uh, the, the good 
swing trades and winning trades, what do those look like? And how can I just catch a meat of the move? I don't need to catch the whole move. How can I catch a good chunk of the move and repeat that over and over again? And so mm -hmm. that was the thought process I took to the day trading side of things. Um, and there's a couple uh, smaller, or I guess little pieces with, with futures that, uh, you know, like the splitting up the target into a small target and the trail stop and those kind of things mm -hmm. that really help accelerate uh, the profit side of the equation. But when you are trading, you know, in the real world, uh, you have the emotional component and mm -hmm. it's just so much easier to have that small winner locked in and then be able, you know, that small winner allows you to get to the big winner. Mm. And, you know, even though I'm here most days, there's some days that I'm not able to trade. So if you are doing a, you know, all in, all out approach with just a trail stop and you miss one or two big winning days, well, now your data set can kind of get skewed and uh, the numbers aren't as good in real life as they are on paper. In theory, this is how it should work. But in actuality, we want to make sure it's working just like you hypothesized. Yeah, so, so you're effectively working with yourself and your own behaviors to tweak whatever has happened because obviously we have that lens through which everybody trades. Nobody just sits down and trades a strategy like go in and go out. Everybody's always, okay, so my childhood traumas and you know, a whole bunch of stuff yep. comes into it. And uh, you can have the great strategy, but if, if you don't have that emotional control or emotional intelligence even that takes a while to develop for a lot of people, um, you're always going to be on the losing side, either because you're not holding trades long enough or because you, uh, you're too quick to trade take profit or you hold trades too long you know this like so many things that can happen now you're an athlete you're a pro cyclist mm -hmm. um do you think that having that sort of like natural self-discipline was the reason why your path was a lot less turbulent i think it definitely helps um you know i started my trading career at a pretty young age so with very little responsibility very little you know overhead and and no family, no major bills and things like that. Those kinds of things really do alleviate a lot of pressure, even if you don't quite realize it. Um, and then from, yeah, from the, the competitive cycling background, just the understanding a lot from the psychological, like the, the sports um, psyche side of things is really helpful in addition to, you know, the, the day in, day out, knowing that, okay, if I do all these small things, very deliberate practice, the thing I've practiced this week starts to become more ingrained. And then next week I can practice another little thing. And the week after that, I can practice another little thing. And you kind of break your trading down in little pieces. And even if it's just saying, okay, this week, um, I'm, I'm going to adhere to my stops. If that's, if you have trouble just getting rid of your stops and then you end up with these huge losses, you know, pick one thing to work on focus on it all week. And then you can kind of have a little more self-control for that piece and then move on to something else. Kind of understanding that, okay, you're not going to become, uh, you know, Michael Jordan didn't become <laughs> what he was in just one season. Uh, it, it's just the constant iterative, you know, get 1% better that type of thing. Yeah, I had the same thing because I come from a high skilled music background. So I'm mm -hmm. actually a multi instrumentalist. I was a saxophone player. I have a classical degree in flute for some strange reason, which I never <laughs> used in, in my life. But yeah. we did the same process. So I think sports, uh, music, and trading are very much mm -hmm. performance disciplines. So you have to identify your weakness and break it down into those smaller digestible chunks and then work on one weakness at a time. And I think where, where most people go wrong is that they try to sort out all of their issues all at once, and that's never going to work. Um, I always say you can't uh, change your bad habits, like stop smoking, get tidy, get fit, <laughs> sort out your, I don't know, your environment. You don't do all of that at once, do you? You kind of like just try and tackle one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that this is why musicians and athletes naturally have that uh, that mindset because we've already been through that process before. Now you run a website called E Mini Mind. How did mm -hmm. that start? So just probably 
12, 13 years ago, not too long after I started trading. I really just started it as a blog, um, you know, so I wouldn't have to carry around a thumb drive and, and, and sort of, for me, writing is very helpful as a way to clarify my ideas. And so with trading, simpler is better. And uh, the cleaner you can keep your trading screen, your trading plan, you know, all the pieces that go into your trading, whether it's visually or in your brain, the simpler you can keep it, the better and the easier it is to execute. So for me, I like to, you know, write down my ideas and, and kind of clarify different pieces of my trading. And so I started doing it on a blog and it just happened to be out there, you know, for the public and started to get comments and questions uh, coming in. And so that's kind of where it took its shape that it is today. People would ask about, oh, can you show me how to do this and whatnot and start doing some videos. And next thing you know, you have this community that all is kind of like-minded uh, individuals, you know, trading, it, it, it's just me sitting here trading. So having, you know, in Chicago, you at least have other people and there were trader meetups and groups that you could become a part of to talk with other traders. But most people, I mean, they don't have another person who trades or a friend or anyone who trades Imagine trading and people who are not traders they just glaze over they're like what are you talking about <laughs> i did find like we had a, a fun mastermind group with some friends who weren't necessarily traders but they had you know, their own businesses or they were entrepreneurs or you know doing this and that and just having other people like that to talk to is really really helpful because you're kind of thinking in a similar way and at least you're open to opportunities and so, you know, those kind of uh, situations were, were really helpful, uh, especially early on. And, uh, you know, going back to the music parallels and with sports, if you think about learning, you know, a, a musical instrument when you're a kid, you know, you sit down, you, you play your instrument for six, eight hours straight and you, you're not 12, distracted. 10, 10, yeah. 12. <laughs> uh, yeah. So your hand, your fingers bleed and you're, yeah. you know, mindless. Um and so there are definitely benefits to incorporating trading into your life in a way that's sustainable and not putting so much pressure on yourself to, okay, by the end of this year, I, I, I want to be successful and quit my job. I mean, if you wanted to become a, a doctor or a dentist, you know, we, we know how long that process takes. Trading isn't as cut and dry, but I would expect it to take probably longer than you think. And so you need to be committed and dedicated in order to do that and be committed. You have to incorporate it into your life and give yourself the time to learn and process and practice and have deliberate practice and all those different pieces, you know, they just take time. I know we've got YouTube and some of this stuff, but even with all the information out there, in a lot of ways, is overwhelming and too much yeah, it's information overload. overload. Yeah. So. And a lot of it is not very good, let's face it. There's a lot of stuff out yeah. there. And in many ways, the biggest channels don't really bring that much value, unfortunately. You know, you have yeah. uh, you have some Forex channels and it's all just trend is your friend and, you know, RSI and MACD. It's like you can't instantly yeah. trade with that. <laughs> it's like great. Yeah, that's what I dislike about uh, especially YouTube and, you know, mm -hmm. the algorithms and stuff. It's all about... How to get your, you know, Highest what's clicks, click yeah. made and mm -hmm. yeah, clicky and stuff. And yeah, you know, I get I get videos and shorts on uh, home building stuff, and it's like, man, that's that is not even correct what yeah. you're telling me. And I know yeah. that, but mm -hmm. these other hundreds of thousands of people probably have no idea, and it's just bad information. And you really yeah. have to dig deep to find value on YouTube. Otherwise, you're just stuck in this like community of people who are just moaning that they're not doing well or that trading is hard and they don't know how to do this. It's like, well, yeah, but moaning about it is not going to help anyone. So why yeah. don't we try and find valid strategies, go back to the data analytics, see what works, see what didn't work, but no, that's too, you know, that's too hard. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a great point. I mean, you really have to own your decisions, mm -hmm. whether you're an entrepreneur or, you know, a lot of people are, are are business owners um, or high level managers that kind of turn to trading and you have to own your decisions and be very um, open with my trade. Like this is a great time, end of the year, reflect on, on your trades from the year, kind of go through your trading plans, make sure, okay, am I, 
I've got all this stuff on my chart, but am I really using this for entering, uh, managing or exiting the trade? And if not, it's probably just cluttering your, your trading and you can get rid of it. And so using this time as a way to go through, I, I, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, the, the data and looking at my trades and I just keep an Excel log kind of old school, but going through those kind of logs and reviewing, that's what gives me a lot of confidence and um, limits a lot of hesitation. So if you're a newer trader and you don't have very many trades under your belt, you know, the first step is just to kind of pick something that resonates with you as far as a trade strategy goes. Uh, at least this would be my, uh, my suggestion. Pick something that resonates with you and just, you know, make 50 trades. And do it on a paper account or a, a, a micro account, just so there's not really much risk on the table. But yeah, make, make it as cheap as possible. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you know, see what happens. Maybe you decide, yeah, this trading thing is actually not what I want to spend my time investing in. But you know, if you were a, a third grader and you wanted to play the trombone, you're not going to go out and you know buy a five thousand dollar instrument right away. You're going to yeah. you know, rent something or, or start with a used instrument and then you can work your way up. Same with bikes, you know, get a, a junky uh, old bike as a kid. And then if you really like it, you can start upgrading and moving your way up. So, yes. so, so you have uh, to earn your right to trade bigger and to have bigger accounts. Yeah. And mm. the barrier to entry is so low with trading. You can get mm. in with very little intraday margin and just a couple thousand dollars. Uh, but there's not really a reason to just blow a bunch of money just because you have it. So if you yeah. focus on the, okay, I want to master my craft when it comes to trading and the, the execution part, you know, then it, it's easy to scale up and add more shares or more contracts, but put the emphasis on, on mastering the craft. And, you know, if you got half a million dollars sitting there to work with, that's great. Um, but just don't pump it into the markets right away until you really have a good handle on what you're doing. Unless you want to throw, you can afford to throw away half a mil. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. But even that, you know, it's just not. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. There's a lot of traders who, uh, who who want to jump from that zero to hero moment. And uh -huh. they just plow in all of their life savings. And they're like, right, I'm doing this. I've quit my job. This is it. And it's like, you don't even have a working strategy. So what you're saying is that you need to have a decent sample size of effectively practice trades and proof that you are getting better. So before you reach that consistency, like, is there any point trading live? I don't think so. And I think that's where, where a lot of traders uh, go wrong and damage their psychological side because you develop psychological traumas. And in fact, all of these interviews, because this is the fifth episode that I've done with, uh, with various traders, and one thing always resonates, that you have to fall in love with the process, not the results. Yes, we're yeah. all here for the money. We know that. But money cannot be the only driver. For me, it's the intellectual stimulation. And by the sounds of it, it's for you as well. It's a challenge, isn't it, to kind of figure out what's going on on the day. Yeah. And, you know, cycling is the exact same analogy. You just replace, you know, money with winning. You know, you want to win bike races. You're not going to win every bike race. And sometimes the training really sucks and it's rainy and it's cold or it's just, you know, it You're hurts pain. a lot to suffer. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you have to love the process and day in, day out, you're focusing on, you know, just the task at hand. And if it's a really lousy day, okay, find one small thing that was good about your training session. And you can say the same thing about your trading session. It was, what was one thing I did good? And, you know, write that down in the journal or in your trade log. And then you can go back and pull from those, you know, the one little thing that was good about that workout or that trading session. And then after a year, you've got all these little things. And so when you're in the moment, your brain is pulling back from those little positive things. You're not thinking about the failed workout you did. You're thinking about, oh, well, at least I fueled good for that ride. And then when you get in these hard situations, you're pulling positive thoughts into your brain and, you know, there's there's countless stories of people who've been, you know, stranded in the wilderness or plane crashes and, you know, or, or stranded on a lifeboat. I mean, the people that survive are the ones that can mentally keep it together. If you, uh, you know, lose hope and, and have all these negative thoughts, then you're, you're pretty much sunk. 
That's that's great. I love that. Uh, so again, a lot of people focus on losing trades and oh my god, this was a terrible day. But to be able to flip that, so just to say, okay, I lost, but did I get one one hypothesis correct? Like, did I at least get the direction right? And if yes, then it becomes more about tweaking your execution. So you, it's it's uh, it's a very useful thing to tweak your mindset that way. So rather than focusing on the huge negatives and all the mess ups, I call it being a Muppet. So we all have Muppet moments every so often. And uh, and I always say say to people, well, you know, just try to be less of a Muppet today. <laughs> so mm-hmm. That's a positive. So what did you do right today? And yes, if if your plan didn't work out, well, did you at least stick to your risk management? Did you at least stop at your designated loss limit? Did you just say, okay, I mm-hmm. lost four trades. I'm going to stop now because this is not happening. That's a positive. That doesn't have to be a negative thing. Yeah. And breaking away from the idea that a losing trade is a bad trade. Instead, you know, okay, if I, if the trade met my criteria when I entered it, then it doesn't matter what the outcome is. Uh, if I could have a good, I, I could have a winning trade that was a bad trade because I just jumped in when I really shouldn't have and I got lucky. And I can't really repeat that again because it was just mostly luck. So focusing on the, you know, like mastering the craft, like we talked about, and uh, in kind of disassociating a losing trade with a bad trade uh, is is a helpful practice. Now, as a part of eMini Mind, uh, you also coach other traders who come to you for help. So, how do you approach that? Because when we, uh, when I caught up with you uh, the other week, you mentioned uh, about um, people looking at their life and their decision making process, and I found that mm-hmm. really intriguing. So, can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, I do a work with a small number of traders. Um, is, you know, not, not very many, uh, but, uh, over the years, you know, it's, it's become, you know, lots of traders. Um, if you're completely green, um, you know, it doesn't pay to spend money to work with someone mm-hmm. one-on-one unless mm-hmm. you got loads of money. And if you haven't learned the basics, so a lot of the traders that I'm working with one-on-one, they already have a pretty good idea of, you know, we're, we're trading similar styles They're They have been trading they've, they've been trading real money for a while and maybe they're just kind of break even, or maybe they've been struggling in other areas. But one of the things that we look at, you know, in addition to, okay, we can compare, okay, what trades did you take compared to the trades I took and then talk about why you did or didn't take the same trades, but also looking at just kind of the bigger picture and other aspects of their life and, if you look at decisions that you've made in the past, you know, do you tend to make good decisions under high pressure? Do you spend lots and lots of time thinking and thinking and thinking and then never make a decision? Or are you able to, you know, I had a a really good friend and mentor say to me, you know, if you make a, a lot of little decisions is better than make waiting and making one big decision. You know, if you make a lot of little decisions and you can just kind of pivot and make another decision to get out of a bad decision, that's totally fine. But if you just sit there and wait and wait and wait and never take a trade and wait and wait and wait and then finally place a trade and it doesn't work out mentally, that's very difficult. There's there's a book, uh, the, the Miracle Equation. And in that book, the guy yeah. says, don't focus on the end goal because you'll just trip up on obstacles along the way. And I think that's exactly the case there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, again, going back to the sports or the music analogies, you take a, um, okay, I'm a football player and I want to make it to the uh, Super Bowl. It's like, okay, well, yeah, you might think about the Super Bowl every day, but you kind of break down your training into, okay, what do I need to do this month, this week, today, and then this next workout? Okay, just focus on getting through this workout, and then you do that day after day, and all of a sudden, you you know make it to the, the big game. So those kinds of things are are very applicable with trading yeah. and, um, and definitely help uh, if you can look at your own decision-making and if it's like, well... I always tend to make really bad decisions. Okay, get to the root of why. And yeah, sure, there could be a little bit of bad luck, but it's probably not all luck. If you do make good decisions over the course of your life in other areas, then that can help 
help you trust some of your decision making when it comes to trading as well. Hmm. You said that you uh, you only trade for about uh, ninety minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, again, less is more, and uh, especially with the futures world, you know, you got twenty four hours worth of trading opportunities. Narrow your focus will help you immensely. And so I'm mostly focusing on the nice open and then the 90 minutes past because that's where the most volume is. That's where you get the European US overlap sessions. So if you can be very narrowly focused, it also cuts down on your risk. Okay. If I'm only trading for 90 minutes, you know, you can only do so much damage in that 90 minutes. And don't, you know, if you set a time block like that, don't go back in the afternoon or after hours and you know, look for yeah, that, that's the problem, that isn't it? Thing. If you're trading earlier part of the day and you do, and somebody doesn't have that kind of discipline to just walk away, uh, maybe a better choice. Like these days, we have a lot of uh, ES uh, movements towards the end of the market. So if somebody's struggling with too too many hours sitting there and just imagining patterns and things, maybe uh, they can flip that. So um, limiting the amount of time and just trading maybe for the last hour of the day because mm -hmm. then there's only an hour that you can do damage to the account if that's what you what yep. people are struggling with right but obviously you as a as a pro cyclist as an athlete you already have that natural ability to just stop yourself um, and to give up and just go okay this is it that was my day now i'm going to do something else i I'd, I'd much rather be flat at the end of the day than mm -hmm. than down and mm -hmm. so I'm okay not taking a trade and not forcing something. And also realize that if you're only trading the open and the close and you go back in the middle of the day and you, you know, look at your chart after it's already happened, you're going to see winning trades, but you won't see the losing trade. So no. don't think that, oh, so I should have traded the lunch hour today yeah, because <laughs> you're, you're only going to, your eyes are only going to spot the winning trades unless you're. Yeah. Very and then uh, and then also there's there's the matter of being so much more aware of the movement when you are in a trade and you don't necessarily uh, know that you would have won that trade because you could have mm -hmm. mismanaged a stop you know you could have not taken profits and the ES is very fast these days it goes up then it turns around it kind of became more like like crude oil or something where you you do get opportunities on both sides which was never really the mm -hmm. case like when I first started trading ES it was um, back in 2013. And I, I honestly, to this day, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it because when I started, it was moving like three handles per day. Uh. <laughs> that was it. It was just ugh, like, it would just kill you to sit there and wait for something to happen. And it would, it would happen like that for weeks on end. And then you'd get one really good day where we would have lots of liquidity. And it was all because of the QE. It was just like a bad time to get involved with the ES, I suppose. Um, which is, I suppose, why I gravitated towards crude oil and gold, which are my main mm. two markets. But in the last two years, we've obviously had COVID happen. And that has drastically change the liquidity of uh, a lot of the uh, equity indices. So can you tell me how that affected you? Did it affect you? Did you have to tweak your strategy a little bit? Uh, no, not really. Um, in times where we have, like in March of 2020, where you have all of a sudden a massive jump in volatility, I typically, you know, the first couple of days, I'll just sit tight mm -hmm. as far as versus trying to, you know, capitalize so on... Observation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was another, you know, period, you know, well, 2008 and 2009, similar situation. It almost felt yeah. like overnight, just volatility jumped up. Yeah. Um, one thing you can do is cut your position size in half and double your mm -hmm. stop. So that'll mm -hmm. keep your risk the same if you're trading four contracts and it would, down to two. And it would slow things down as well, because rather yep. than trying to get involved in an intraday uh, situation, you are still in a trade, but it gives you time to think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So that slows things down. Um, you know, if you're day trading day in and day out, you're probably not making your, your biggest days probably aren't those few monster trend days that occur. You're yeah. probably, you know, more consistent taking mm -hmm. winning trades day in and day out. So I'm not concerned about like, oh, the market had a big, you know, big move today and I only had one trade. So mm -hmm. yeah, when, you know, with COVID, um, it definitely, it brought more traders into the market. And so there was more 
volatility and liquidity and um yeah i think i mean covid was was my best year ever so I, yeah sounds, same <laughs> bad to say but uh no, same. You know, i know i know it's from uh you know, long-term and, and swing trading perspective, but also yeah. from a, a day trading perspective. So, yeah, I, I had exactly the same situation where people ask me, Hey, uh, how did your strategy change? Well, I have a way to scale my stop losses. Uh, that that's always to do with volatility that we're currently mm. experiencing. So that doesn't really affect me that much, but I have a concept of the time of day. So I rely on time of day for a lot of the moves and obviously with the profile and with a whole bunch of other stuff. But generally, I found that apart from the big ranges, the markets were still following the same patterns. Like mm -hmm. I didn't have to change anything. It was just all there. The only thing that changed is that my targets got reached quicker. And that was uh -huh. awesome. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's I where keeping it. things simple is so important. If your strategy is so specific with all these moving parts to specific you know market direction and volatility and one thing changes then the whole thing falls apart yeah. you want to be able to have a strategy where you could say yeah i could just take this strategy and move it to a different time frame a different market i could trade it over here and over there and yeah i might have to make a little tweak to the stop just based on mm -hmm. tick size or something like that yeah. but by and large the strategy the concept works across different markets different time frames that's what you want to have something that's sustainable over the years yeah. and you know these pit traders and and traders that have been doing it for 20 30 years you know that's what they have something simple unless you're a you know specifically a quant at a you know hedge fund um with computers to back you up mm -hmm. you're probably not sitting there as an individual trader um, trying to scalp against you know computers well, you say, you say have... that you say that but there are traders who are trying to do that <laughs> that's true you don't want yeah. to be you know going back originally what i said about unfair advantage you know okay a computer has very much an unfair advantage when it comes to taking a couple of ticks and doing it with hundreds and hundreds of contracts mm. at a time whereas you know Sure, if you could take two ticks here and two ticks there, and then you have one stop out, and then it all goes away. So mm -hmm. finding your, you know, unfair advantage as an individual trader um, is really important. Mm. So you mentioned swing trading, and uh, I want to know: Do you still do swing trading alongside your intraday trading? Yeah, and I actually find it very uh, complementary because when volatility is really low, and there's maybe not as many intraday trades or the moves are smaller for, for day trading, you tend to have swing trades that that kind of stick around longer and work really well. And then vice versa, if you have a lot of day trades and volatility is higher, then maybe I won't have as many swing trades. So mm. um, yeah, I mean, even just doing simple things like uh, you know buying puts when the market bounces um, and we're in a downtrend, uh, just to, to capitalize on you know sell-offs, especially ahead of like the Fed meeting announcement and that kind of stuff. Um, you don't have to make a ton of swing trades, but mm -hmm. if you have some kind of long position or a short position, and let's say you do have a long position, and the market gaps up. Okay, now you're 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 still participating in the move, and you maybe take a little bit of the pressure off to have to make a day trade that day because well, I'm I'm, I'm capitalizing on the market move already over here versus feeling like oh the market gapped up. Um, I don't have any position on, I better make a day trade and you kind of force things. So I find it as a nice complimentary. You don't have to do it. Um, you know, maybe take a couple trades a month mm -hmm. and I manage those trades at the close. So I'm not doing it at the same time as I'm day trading, which is at the open. So it's, um, it's yeah, I have, a, hands -off I, I have a portfolio of uh, of stocks uh, that's a, a mix of a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of them are tech stocks, though, because uh, that's that's my uh, area of interest, and I I am very good at following news, and I'm a bit of a nerd, like as we all are, I guess. And I had the same kind of feeling when uh, whenever I'm trading ES, if I would be kind of going long, I'm like, well, why am I doing this when I'm already making like this? It was a bull market and I'm like already making all that cash over there. So I didn't really feel the need mm -hmm. to trade equity indices much from that perspective. Uh -huh. But at the same time, my commodities uh, trading, so crude oil and gold, um, it, that's something that's completely different for the most part. Um, during COVID, there have been some correlations that completely changed. So, for example, traditionally, gold used to be completely the opposite of whatever the equity indices were doing. Well, that's not really the case anymore. 
it might come back, but we had some very odd market conditions in the last decade post credit crunch. So I think that's why all of that somewhat broke down. And then during COVID, we had the highest risk event ever. We had a black swan event, and yet gold and ES were kind of going in the same direction. So that was a uh, little bit confusing for some of the more uh, traditional uh, portfolio managers. And I, I remember reading all of these uh, um, these articles, how, oh, my God, well, now what? You know, this is no longer working. And it reminded me of uh, of the times when we used to have arbitrage opportunities. Now, I don't know, you, you were probably uh, beginning to trade when arbitrage was still a thing. So we used to have all of these traders that kind of wanted to do intraday trading, but everything they ever did was just arbitrage. And then once the computers got very effective, arbitrage just disappeared as a retail strategy or any kind of strategy where uh, you can have that uh, that uh, uh, disparity between the two similar products going together. And uh, to me, it was just such a relief because I was like, you know what? I'm an intraday trader. I don't really need to pay that much attention to you know what gold is doing, what equities are doing, because I, tr- I trade them in an, almost like an isolated environment. At the same time, I am aware of the macro side and while macro side maybe comprises about 30% of what I do, for the most part, I'm a technical trader. So does macro economy uh, come into your analysis at all? Not a huge part, especially for the intraday side. Um, and then even for, you know, this my boring old buy and hold type mm-hmm. uh, retirement investments, yeah. um, you know, time and interest rate are your, your, two best friends. So Mm -hmm. if you've got the time, there's not that much risk in, you know, it really cuts down your risk over, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so it's, it's not that critical. I found, Mm -hmm. I do pay attention to news announcements that that are Mm -hmm. coming out during the day um, and fed meeting announcements and things like that. But I'm not so focused on what the number is. It's more about the reaction to the number, just like an earnings announcement. The, Amazon could come out with good earnings, but if it's lower than what was expected, the stock could go down. It's so, go down, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, with with day trading, it's more about looking at the chart and less about the fundamentals. Yeah. And um, even with long term investing and, and swing trading, is is for me is still more about the chart. Mm. So tell me, are you still doing cycling? Is that still something you actively do, or yeah. do you have yeah? Yeah, I don't race uh, quite as much. I've got a two-year-old daughter now, so I've kind of uh, stepped back from Mm -hmm. from the racing um, and more so the traveling around the U.S. and things to race. But um, yeah, we've got a good series here in Arizona and um, kind of split my time between Arizona and uh, the Black Hills and South Dakota in the summer when it's hot here in Arizona. So yeah, there's lots of opportunities to race and get out and it's still really fun and I ride most every day still. So yeah. It definitely, you know, getting away from the screen, whatever your hobby is, or even if it's just going for a walk is really, really helpful to clear your mind. That's when you have your light bulb moments and things click. And so if you're struggling with your trading, you know, that's why, you know, even holiday weekends are really great because you can get away. You're forced away from the the screen and Mm. you give your brain some time to process Uh, or even just planning in breaks. There's somebody who left a comment on one of my videos when I was talking about FOMC, and he said, uh, how to stop yourself losing money uh, uh, whilst the FOMC rate decision is happening? Uh, Go out for a walk and then just keep walking. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I purposely don't trade on the uh, FOMC Wednesdays. Yeah, neither do I, yeah. Um, I mean, it, That's, even that seems you, to be a running theme for pro traders. I, I don't really know many people who have uh, confidently said, oh, yeah, FMC is where I make money. For, for the most mm-hmm. part, nine, nine out of 10 people all say, including myself, I've never really made any serious money on FMC. And honestly, I've lost money on it. So the way I look at it, I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to get a drink, you know, watch the show, but I'm not actually going to get yeah. involved. Yeah, because you could be right in the direction, but there's so much whipsaw movement at the announcement yeah. that you could be kicked out before it even goes your way. Yeah. And then by forcing yourself, to, like for me, I usually go on a long ride on that Wednesday mm-hmm. and it kind of sets you up better with that break already that's planned to trade better in the next 
days yeah. and weeks ahead. So yeah. if you if you don't schedule breaks and, and plan rest like that, that's when you get burnt out and mm. you just start dragging your feet and mentally you're just a wreck. Yeah. Yeah. So rest, plenty of rest, keeping your brain fresh. I also find that diet helps. A lot of people mm -hmm. are on junky diets. I can't imagine that that's very good for them. Um, even if I'm not like super strict with my, my nutrition, I still try to eat clean. I, I, you know, I have an occasional drink, but it's not like, you know, I get up and I'm like, Oh yeah, no, I'm going to drink. It's like once a week, maybe mm -hmm. towards the end of the week, usually if yeah. I'm not doing videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you eat good 90% of the time and you get good, you know, rest, that's that solves most all oh, ailments yeah. and mental disorders. And yeah, you yeah. can go ahead and have that cookie and cake and the beer and whatnot, but make it, you know, 10% of your diet. And yeah. sure, you know, you get some less sleep a couple nights during the week, but if most nights are pretty regular and if you can wake up at the same time every day, even if you go to bed, maybe a little later or a little earlier mm -hmm. sometimes. If you try to be on the wake up routine that's the same, yeah, your body will definitely thank you for it. Yeah. So just sticking to the routine across the board, not just in trading, but also generally as a part of your lifestyle. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Cause those life stresses, you don't want to be trading. If, I mean, if you have a lot of life stresses going on, mm -hmm. take a break from trading or take the week yeah. off. Or if you've got, you know, sick kids or this, yeah, or the markets will be there. Moving. The markets will be there. Yeah. They won't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. They were here, yeah, you know, for hundreds of years before any of us were yep. here and they will be here for the long after we're all gone. So yeah, no, no FOMO. In fact, uh, we were all talking about Jomo, joy of missing out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get away. I'm, plug and uh it's it's recharge yeah for you. Yep. all right tim so uh, tell me where, where can people find you online are you on youtube twitter search emini mind on youtube um or you go to eminimind.com those are the, probably the best places to to find out more um and you can always uh shoot me an email to tim at emini mind mm -hmm. is my email if you have questions mm -hmm. and you're on youtube usually on tuesdays um, I, yeah, I post weekly videos and then I do a live trading session every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, Tim, uh, we're out of time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Thanks for having me. Now, I would like to ask our viewers to uh, to like and to comment on this video because it obviously helps the channel to battle the almighty YouTube algorithm. I'm also going to link that top step panel that we were both a part of a while back uh, because that one had quite a lot of gold nuggets in there. That's all for today. Now, remember to trade safe and uh, try to be less of a Muppet every single day. And we'll see you next time.